My guest today is a husband, father of three, surgeon, musician, and he's here to tell us today about his music and his faith. Welcome to Bridges. I'm Monica Schmelter, and I'm glad that you could join us today. My guest today is John Falcone, and he wears a lot of hats. He's a husband, he's a dad, he's a musician, he's a surgeon, and he's also going to share with us today how he came to faith in Christ. And John, just so nice to meet you and have you here oh, today. Oh, thank you, Monica. It's a pleasure. So, I'm, you know, you wear a lot of hats. So my first question would be, how in the world do you balance all of that, John, to be a husband, a dad, surgeon, musician? It is, it is challenging. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of it was born out of my surgical training. It's a time in my life where I was working 80 hours a week, and it's one of those things where one just has to be very efficient with how, how one manages a schedule. And so I... for. For as much as I can, I try to leave work at work if possible. Mm -hmm. It's not always the, not always possible, but uh, I try to keep family uh, separate, and um, and I try to include my faith and music and uh, my Venn diagram. Just has a lot of overlap because with with a lot of hats that I wear, I just need to be uh, efficient with my use of time. And I can see that. And what I really hear you saying is that while you're in your surgical training. You just worked lots and lots of hours and you just learned how to be efficient and how to be productive. So you're used to kind of carrying that heavy volume. Exactly. I'm interested in, you know, you're here to talk about your musical project and it really is all about your faith. Tell me about your faith and when and how you came to faith in Christ. And so that's kind of a long question, Monica, <laughs> but um, I, my my road to faith has been kind of a long one. I I grew up and I was sort of a, a good kid, so to speak. I was I was in the I was an altar boy in my Catholic church, and I was the valedictorian in my high school, and I went to states and cross country, and I was a, I did well in music. And uh, so you really were like a good kid, the kind of kid that any parent would be like, oh, so proud of. Well. My mom would say that, right? <laughs> but, uh, and so I, I think, I mean, on the outside, that the answer was yes. But mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was a good person, but I was not a saved person. Mm -hmm. uh, once I got out of into my teenage years in college, I just kind of fell away from from God almost completely, and uh, uh, I was in a dark place. I was angry all the time. I had issues mm -hmm. with sin of all sorts of uh, all sorts, and. Um, I just kept thinking I was a I'm a smart person I can figure this out by myself. But after decades of uh, just continuous failures, it just to come to the realization that there's this free gift for me in the freedom that Christ can give me. It's uh, it's amazing. And so um, I was baptized when I was 38 years old. Wow! Congratulations! Uh, thank, you, thank you very much. <laughs> I was uh, baptized with a, a six year old and a and an eight year old, and they were kind of looking up at me, asking me if I was too old to be baptized. And so, no, the, the answer is no, you're never, Absolutely. it's never too late. And that is one of the main messages behind the, the music ministry and the record that we're yeah. here to talk about. Because, today. you know, John, I thought that was one of the interesting things is that you really, before you came to Christ at 38, kind of thought it was too late for you with faith and having any opportunity. Is there a special reason for that? Or that was just what you thought? Yeah, it was just sort of what I thought maybe a result of the environment that I, I grew up in, but it seemed like uh, a lot of my Christian friends, uh, they just had everything together, and I mm -hmm. I was a mess, although I was pretty good at putting on a mask and hiding it, mm -hmm. uh, honestly. But uh, um, I just kind of thought that after all these failures, like, well, I'm, I'm doomed to fail because there's nothing I can do, and I just didn't. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you would say after all these failures, because most people would look at your life on the outside and think, well, you have three beautiful children, you have a beautiful wife, you're a surgeon, you, you have been like very blessed with music, you took all kinds of music lessons, and, and we'll talk about this project and just all of that, and yet inside, you didn't feel like everything was okay. No, it was a, I was a mess, uh, mm. lot, lots of shadows and darkness and uh, you know, with a, but a, a smile on my face. Again, I got sort of good at being able to hide mm -hmm. all that stuff. And now 
I don't need to. There, there Isn't been, that chains wonderful? have been broken. I'll tell you, it is. It's an amazing. Yeah. It's, life is amazing. That is absolutely wonderful. And now in this project, Falcone Rising, um, I listen to the music on it, and you know it's a it's a Christian rock project. But every song is related to a Bible verse. Let's talk about that. So this music project is really at its basic core. It's a ministry. And as a, as a ministry, I, I think it needs to be focused on the Bible. Um, when I was younger going to services, I always enjoyed looking in the hymnals and, uh, and seeing the Bible verses associated with the songs. And I, I thought that that would be a really good way to um, use this as a ministry uh, to help fulfill the Great Commission by using Bible verses in the music to help mm -hmm. draw people to Christ. Yeah, and it does that. And the genre of music it is, I thought, would reach some people that might not, you know, want to listen to a hymn or be at that place in their life or their faith at that point. And so let's talk about the genre of music that it is and kind of your training. And uh, as I understand, when you were younger, you know, you were interested, you trained classically in the opera and that sort of thing. So I wanted to hear that journey to this project. So... Uh, that that that's another long journey, I, I'm afraid. <laughs> but um, I I was first classically trained as a as a trumpet player and and as a vocalist. Uh, I was I probably peaked in my vocal career when I was a boy soprano. Uh, I ended up being a lead character in a Christmas-based opera. Um, but it was really through the the trumpet that I I, I learned all all about music and mm -hmm. more about the theory behind it. And uh, I've, I've never had a, a guitar lesson or a piano lesson, although I, I, I've taught myself how to, how to play both of those. And, uh, That's amazing. Instruments. And uh, yeah, it, and it's just something that I, I need music in my life. And uh, as if I didn't, I would have really no, no other great outlets for, for relieving the stress that's associated with my yeah. my career yeah so music is like a stress reliever in it is an a huge stress reliever you. and a, a creative outlet as well mm -hmm. and, and it's a ministry yes because you've got all that those bible verses packed in there i do want to ask you john you know i'm so glad and so thankful that at 38 you came to accept christ as your savior did you make a public announcement about your faith and what was that like for you so short answer is um, sort of. <laughs> um, when, when I was baptized, there was a little bit of a profession of faith, mm -hmm. uh, but I think a lot of the, a lot of the uh, profession of faith and testimony is coming out of uh, outlets related to this uh, ministry project and the album. Mm -hmm. How about your wife? Was she already a person of faith or how did that come into play? Yes, uh, she she's been, she's been saved for a long time, and uh, and she married somebody that wasn't, mm -hmm. um, and so she she's an amazing, beautiful woman, and uh, I, I couldn't be more blessed to have her as my wife. Or, or our three kids are just yeah. I saw wonderful. your family a picture on the website. <laughs> beautiful family that God has blessed you. you with. So now, what would you say if you had to draw a picture for us of what your life looks now with Christ and before, what would that look like? So I think a lot of it is, is maybe stuff that you can't see mm -hmm. in that there has been a, a genuine change of heart. And, and I think that that's probably the most important thing. And that's just not something that, something that everybody can see. Um, you know, you would have thought I was a saved person when I was a kid, but I... I just, yeah. I just was not. I think that uh, a lot of the things that you can see about me include uh, sort of a change in my demeanor. Um, I used to be just angry all the time, and uh, what were I, you I was, angry about? Uh, just every, I mean everything. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and and nothing at the same time. I think um, I used to curse a lot, and and you won't hear that coming from me anymore. So that that's one of the one of the ways that I, I think that I've changed more visibly. Also, in the, I, I used to have an al alcohol problem. I'll just be mm -hmm. be honest about it, and so, uh, and now I don't. And so it, praise it's, God, it, that's yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, and it's good that you can just talk about it because a lot of times people think, John, well, 
once I get into my 30s or whatever that age is for them, they think, well, you know, it's too late. Like, I can't make this change, whether that's alcohol or drugs or, I mean, gosh, it can be other things like greed. It, it can be, you know, just, so, just our basic selfishness as people. But it's never too late. It's never too late. It's never too late to come to Christ. And if someone went out and they got this, Fal Falcone Rising, what would your prayer or hope be for them as they listen to this music? So my, my prayer is, and with this ministry, the, the mission is to fulfill the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. And so the, my ultimate goal is to bring people towards Christ. If they're a follower, then hopefully it brings them closer to Christ. Mm -hmm. If they're a lost person like I was for you know, a, a vast majority of my life, if, if I could, I, I work on saving lives in the operating mm -hmm. room, but if I can save someone's eternity, that would just be uh, amazing. Yeah. And you know, it, it, when we come to faith in Christ, our entire perspective changes, you know, because if you don't have Christ, we're just entrenched with the here and now, and we're not able to see that eternal perspective. But for example, John, like what you just said, prior to that, being able to save somebody's life, maybe in the operating room or wherever, that is a, that's an awesome blessing. It's wonderful, but it's nothing compared to a person without hope, a person without faith, coming to Christ. Do you, do you pray over the people that listen to this or would you consider to do that? Yeah, I, I honestly haven't, haven't so much, but uh, that, that would be something to add to my prayer list. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, we all want people to come to Christ and yet it takes like a miraculous moment. It's like a Holy Spirit moment for a person to come to faith. And there's just nothing like it. There's not even a way to describe that experience. We've got to take a break. We want you to stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk more to John about this project and how it is based in the Bible. The name of the project, again, is Falcone Rising. We'll be back in just a moment. Don't miss another episode of Bridges. Subscribe to our YouTube channel today where you can find all of Monica's latest teachings and interviews. It's easy to do. Just visit youtube.com, search Monica Schmelter and click subscribe. Once you are subscribed, click the bell icon to get notified when a new episode is available to view. Thanks for watching Bridges. If you're just joining us today on Bridges, I am talking with John Falcone, and he's a man that wears a lot of hats. He's a husband, he's a dad, he's a surgeon, he's a musician, and he also recently has come to a place of faith and is now using his music as a way to fulfill the Great Commission. And John, before the break, we were talking about that moment of salvation, of giving our hearts to Christ. is the biggest miracle ever that the scales could fall from someone's eyes. And I know for myself, like if you would have asked me two minutes before I gave my heart to Christ, if I was willing to do that, I would have said, absolutely not. Like I didn't even see it coming. Was it like that for you? So I, I didn't really have a miraculous, all-encompassing moment. Gotcha. I, I, I kind of think of it as I, I was wearing, kind of wearing a blindfold and there's a light on behind me. And over time, I just sort of eventually turned and, and all of a sudden now mm -hmm. the blindfold's off. I'm looking at the light and, and it's, it's a new day. It's a new life. It's amazing. And I just think of the people watching, John, and the hope that that brings them because you know, like me, I didn't see it coming. You, it was kind of slowly over time. But the thing is, it doesn't matter how it happens. It's just important <laughs> that it happens. What do you see now? Is this your first uh, faith-filled music project? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see more coming in the future? Or what are you thinking? I, I do. I mean, I, I play the guitar all the time and I'm always Kind of writing new material and again i need that in my life uh, as a stress relief and as a creative outlet for mm -hmm. myself is it stressful to be a surgeon i mean it, i would it think can, it, would be. it can be there are yeah. very there are times when it's not but uh there are times when it's more than almost i can i can bear sometimes i can imagine not just the hours but dealing with people and holding their lives in your hands so to speak and all of that has your faith changed your vocation as a surgeon? Yes, it has. I, I think that 
Uh, I mean, more out, outwardly, you can see me praying with my patients more. Really? And I find myself uh, praying for them um, and really kind of trying to put myself in their in their shoes. And so um, there's only so much I can do. And, and I'm, I'm not, uh, I know a lot of surgeons have a God complex. Right. I, <laughs> that's not me. And, and I, mm -hmm. I'm not God, but I hope to think that he works through me Amen. and through my hands and through my decisions. Uh, for the for the benefit of those around me, my brothers and sisters. Yeah, I absolutely believe that he does. He is the great physician. Amen. And I always think of Luke, you know, the beloved physician, you know, and just his writings in the Bible and how rich they are and just what a heart of compassion he has. So I have to believe, John, that God is working through your hands as a surgeon. And were you afraid at all the first time that you prayed with with the patient for the first time? Not really. The, the first time I did it in, in one of my church family members, and so it, it was, I sort of knew that I was going to be successful. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the areas I think that I'm a little bit challenged with is trying to be a little bit more bold in people that I don't think are necessarily followers of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, what, I, what I hate to do is to pray for somebody before I take out their gallbladder and they get offended. Uh, right. so it's, like, <laughs> it's like everybody gets offended at, at most things nowadays, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. I, I'm just trying to be a little bit more bold in my faith to, yeah. to help use my, mm -hmm. you know, my position to help draw people to Christ as well. Yeah, and that's a real fine line in following the Holy Spirit to look for that open door when people are open to us praying with them. I know that I'm always praying about that and looking for that because if the door's not open, pushing it open does, it just makes a person really mad. And you don't want to make your patients angry before they go to surgery. No, never, never. <laughs> you know, as a physician, you want them to be at their very best. But yet, I'm sorry to say that a person would get offended just because we offer prayer, because you can always say no if you don't want it. But that's a place that our culture is at. Have you noticed in your family, now that you've really come to faith in Christ, have they recognized that you're not as angry and that your priorities are different? I think so. Yeah, I guess you'd have to ask them, <laughs> but I, I like to believe so mm -hmm. uh, because I, I do get comments from other people. Um, yeah, what kind so, of comments do you get? Well, mainly, mainly it's about my kind of my overall demeanor and, uh, you know, I'm just not angry and I'm not not cursing anymore. Yeah, that's really miraculous. And, uh, what you're so, talking about yeah. is miraculous. Do you find yourself when you, I know you said that salvation happened for you really slowly over time. Your eyes kind of opened up to the truth. Did you always believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God and that he was the only way to the father? Or were there times that you didn't believe that that was true? So I guess when, probably when I was a child, I had a child's faith, and so yeah. I, I believed it. Um, but um, over time, I, I, I'm not even sure I asked the question because there was a long point in my life where I didn't even think about it. Ah. Uh, and so I didn't think about that question at all, which uh, sounds bad to say it, but that's that's how it was for me. And um, and, and so now, now answer it now, to answer the question, I think I've, I've gone back to more of my childlike uh, faith and, and that he is absolutely the, the, the way and um, the, the only way. Yeah. And, you know, it's not easy as an adult. It's not the natural thing to have childlike faith. You know, I remember as a kid, someone told me that God was everywhere. And so I remember going into the kitchen cupboard and saying, hi, God, and looking <laughs> like under the glasses and stuff. And like, that's so ridiculous now, but when I think about it, but as a child, I had just been told that God was everywhere. And my mom will say that I would go out on the back porch and I'd look up in the sky and I'd say, hi, God, you know, that's childlike faith. But, you know, then there became a period in my life that I no longer believed that that, that, that was really true. Um, I thought it could be, but I wasn't completely convinced until I came to that miraculous moment in my life where those blinders really fell off and I saw, oh my goodness, Jesus really is the Savior and I'm not getting out of here <laughs> uh, without giving my heart to Christ because I need to do that. So I think it's amazing that you get those comments from people around you that they see those differences because that's one of the ways we can know, you know, that transformation has taken place. 
If you would have looked back at your life as a, as a child, you know, you were classically trained, you had all of those, you know, kudos in music and took all of those lessons, would you have ever been able to look out at this place in your life and think, this is the kind of music, this is what you'd be doing? No, I didn't, didn't really think I'd be doing this, mm -hmm. uh, but here we are. What did you think? <laughs> like, did you have, when you were a kid, did you think I'm going to grow up to be a surgeon or what, what did you think? No, I didn't. Didn't really know what I was going to grow up to be. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up on a farm, and uh, so I, there was that was so, sort of one thing that was floating around in my head. I have a younger brother who's taking taking over our family farm wow. in Western New York State, but um, I haven't always wanted to be a physician. I sort of grew into that by watching a uh, one of my grandmothers go through a case of ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. and uh, just that happened right around my college years, and so. I thought, oh, maybe medicine's for me, and so I, I studied for the MCAT. I took it. I did well in it, and uh, and then. You know. Well, congratulations! That's oh, wonderful. Oh, no, thank you, thank you. So you didn't have that thought until college. Yeah. Uh, That's kind of amazing in and of itself, John. Most people sort of know in high school and study in their undergrad years, and by watching a family member. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. So what would you say to someone, John, right now who's just struggling with faith? Maybe they're in their 30s like, like you are. What would you say to them to help them understand that it's never too late? Well, I, I, would, I would get the good book and I would go through it with them and try to use that as a, as a ministry opportunity. I, I, I would give them a CD and, yes. <laughs> and then we can listen. As I think that's a little bit more, uh, that's my voice, uh, my heart on, on a record. And, uh, and we, can, we, can, we can go through the, the Bible that way as well. Yeah. And, you know, I think music is kind of, you know, it's like the universal language. You know, it's people like to listen to it. It affects our moods. It affects the way that we think. And it really can Sometimes our guard goes down when we're listening to music. What does your wife and, and your children think about this project, Falcone Rising? Uh, they've been nothing but supportive, and uh, it, it sort of cracks me up. I, we'll listen to this in the car because my kids, they want to listen to it. So of course they do. You know, to hear an eight, a six, and a five-year-old singing a, a song that I wrote is just it's heartwarming. And uh, so they've been very, very supportive and very patient because there's been a, this has been a process, and uh, it's a process that probably will repeat itself. Yeah, and I, and I would think, you know, all kids, and you know, want to be spending time with their dad, and you're already gone as a surgeon lots of hours, so I would think that this, for everybody in your family, was a sacrifice of time. Yes, it, it, it was, but again, I, I do try to overlap music and family and, and God, and, and try to separate that from work if I can. Not always possible, but no, I do what, do what I can, and Whatever the Lord wills, that's what I'll do. Absolutely, and that is wonderful. I want to thank you so much, John, for coming today. Thank you, Mom. And for Mom, sharing your awesome. story and your faith. It's been good to talk with you. You too. Thank you. Stay tuned. Monica will be right back with closing comments. Welcome to Bridges. I'm Monica Schmelter. I'm glad that you could join us today. All of these different people united on the same team, uh, praying for each other, blessing each other and it was that hope and that faith is why I survived. When my dad was preaching for a youth revival, uh, and I don't know what happened still, I can't believe it. I was the first person who stood up and Amen. walked down the aisle. He gave me my first Bible and he opened the window in my life to Christian faith, to Jesus Christ. When you want the Lord to speak to you, it's like you don't know what he's going to tell you. If we'll be just that one that could step up in faith to say, God, I just trust that you have better than this. No one else can tell you what you need except God. Because he loves us. We're his children. Do you have a ministry or business? You can contact Nashville's WHTN for studio and programming rates. Visit ctntv.org slash studio or call 615-754-0039 for more details. 
Today on Bridges, we talked a lot about the greatest miracle of all, and that is the miracle of salvation. And I remember as I look at my life, if you would have asked me two minutes before I gave my heart to Christ if I was going to do that, I would have told you absolutely not. And yet my guest today, John Falcone, shared how really for him it was over the years that the blinders fell off and he was able to see Jesus Christ as Savior, as the way, as the life, and as the truth to get to God. And perhaps as you've been watching today, you've been spurred to think about faith. Maybe you knew the Lord and enjoyed a close relationship with Him years ago, but life, time, and circumstances, and just the stuff and trials of life have gotten in the way, and you really haven't given much thought to your relationship with Christ. Or perhaps you're in the situation where you've heard about God, you've heard about that Jesus stuff, but you're not quite sure what to think about all that. I wanna share this with you, that God loves you, God loves me. He loves us all so much that he sent his son Jesus into the world so that there could be a way that we could be made right with God, so that there could be a way for all of our sins, our trespasses, our wrongdoings, our mistakes, our failures, whatever word you want to put to them, he made a way so that we could be forgiven, so that our slate could be wiped clean, like a total and complete cleaning of the slate. We get that when we ask Jesus Christ to forgive our sins and we ask him to come into our life and to be the savior of our life. So I want to lead you in this prayer. And I wanna say this, if there's any tug in your heart at all, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you think, well, I would do that if I, just, if I knew for sure and if God would speak to me. But if you have any tug, any unction in your heart, that is the Holy Spirit working in you and working through you to bring you to faith in God. So I'm going to lead you in this prayer so that you can make a fresh commitment to Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. Please forgive me of my sins and make me right again. Make my heart clean. Cleanse me with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and forgive me and give me a brand new start. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, your slate is clean, and this is a brand new day and a brand new life fresh in Jesus Christ. And I encourage if you prayed that prayer to begin to read your Bible, and I suggest that you start in the book of John and just make time every day to get to know him better and to find the new life in Christ that he has for you. We're out of time, we've gotta go, but we say goodbye and God bless you.